uh, welcome to Posher comes to Armenia. So we're, we're probably going to do something a little different because this presentation was originally aimed, and yesterday I gave the same presentation for uh, working programmers, but I, I, I we'll, we'll see who's in the room and we'll tailor it to that. So you guys are data science students, first year. You are going to start a CS degree in September, mm -hmm. and you, sir, you're, you're an active developer. So we have a range. We have someone who is, uh, so you were the target audience for this. So I'll try to do something in between, maybe. Are you familiar with Clojure at all? Uh, Not really. No, no. Yeah, OK. So maybe I'll go quickly through the presentation. I'm not going to talk too much about the more advanced things. Uh, we can talk later if you're interested, no problem. And uh, then maybe I'll play with the language in the REPL, and I'll talk about closure with respect to data science, because it's, it's actually a very good fit. Python is like the number one language right now for data science. It's the most popular. Uh, R is probably the second most popular. But closure is catching up, and it's, it's actually a great fit. And I'll point you to some resources, actually. So you might want to consider that. So this is the creator of Clojure, Rich Hickey. If you're a programmer, I understand watching. I recommend watching all of his talks. Even if you don't program Clojure, uh, I think you will learn a lot. And it may change how you work in your own language, whatever language you use. And that's how he describes Clojure. It's a dynamic general purpose programming language combining the approachability and interactive development of, of scripting language with an efficient and robust infrastructure for multi-threaded programming. That's a lot of words. So basically, you know, programming was done like in C++ than Java. And that offered uh, some security guarantees, some performance uh, benefits, uh, garbage collector with Java. Uh, but it was tedious. There was a lot of ceremony. You had to write a lot of stuff. And then languages like Python and Ruby sort of took care of that issue. Uh, they're much more fun to work in, and uh, it's just easier to get going. There's not a lot of ceremony. And Clojure attempts to bring those two worlds together and much more. So this is me. That's my email. If you want to email me for any reason, feel free. I started with C++ Java, and I played with many different languages a little bit. And uh, finally, I learned Lisp, and then I settled on Clojure. Clojure is a Lisp, as we'll talk. And I have big corp corporation experience. I have startup experience. I work with data-intensive applications and distributed systems. So I already asked you about you guys. I know who you are. We have first-year data science students. We have a Python programmer and a CS student to be in September. Uh, so. Basic characteristics of the language closure, it's a Lisp, which means its code is data. So it's not a string like you have in pretty much any other language. It's actually data structures that you can manipulate with the language. And it's much easier to manipulate than manipulating a string. It's functional, meaning you work with not objects, but functions and pure functions primarily. A pure function is something that always returns the same value when you pass it the same arguments. And that makes it easy to test and easy to understand, easier. Um, as opposed to having a lot of state so that if, if your function is referencing something from the outside world that can change, then the function can return a different result with the same arguments, which becomes uh, much more difficult to reason about. Sometimes you need something like that. But you need much less, this is called state. You need much less state than we typically use in traditional languages like Python, Java, or pretty much any language that's non-functional. And these functions in Clojure, they operate on a rich set of immutable data structures. So we end up with data-oriented programming. So instead of manipulating classes like we have in most other languages, we manipulate data structures. And we have special facilities for handling mutable states. It, it, Clojure is hosted on the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine was originally designed for the Java language. It provides a garbage collector and other facilities for the language. So when you have a programming language, 
uh, it needs what's called a platform, right? Something to support it. So it could be an operating system, uh, like, or it could be a virtual machine, like the Java virtual machine. Other languages have their own virtual machines. And it compiles to what's called Java bytecode, which is basically the most basic building blocks on the Java virtual machine. But the benefit of Clojure being a hosted language, so it was targeting this specific platform, is that it can take advantage of all of its facilities and there's very easy interrupt with Java. So any Java library you can use very easily from Clojure. And there's also something called Clojure Script, which is the same language that compiles to JavaScript. So you can reach anywhere that JavaScript is, which is the web browser is the big one, and then there's Node.js and this other stuff. So the same language can reach the Java virtual machine and uh, the JavaScript world, which is very nice as a programmer because you can learn one language and you have reach pretty much everywhere. And you can have closure on the back end and on the front end, and it makes for a nice coherent system and actually the back-end programmer can jump in and do some front-end work much more easily and the other way around. And it's not new closure, it's been around since 2006, but it's definitely a niche language, it's a small language. This is just, you don't have to understand this, this is just what it looks like, just a feel for it. And you see a lot of parentheses and brackets and it usually people are you know, afraid of the brackets and the parentheses, but don't fear the brackets, don't fear the parentheses. You can, you'll easily get used to them quickly. And if you look at the indentation, you see that the indentation helps you understand the structure of the code. And you know, in a couple of weeks, the parentheses fall out of you. You don't even notice them. And uh, so I'm not gonna talk about homoiconicity, but that's that same idea that this code, it's actually data. So this opening parenthesis represents a list, like a linked list, basically and the brackets represent a vector, and these data structures, this code is represented as a set of data structures, nested data structures, as opposed to a string, which makes it easy to manipulate it and produce new code, and that enables something called a macro, which can help you extend the language. Other languages have macros, but they're much less powerful. So who uses Clojure? New Bank is a huge Brazilian bank. They're the, probably the most dominant user of Clojure. Climate Corp was a startup, became a billion dollar company. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, they don't write their main product in Clojure, no. But there are groups within these companies that use Clojure successfully. And Cisco, eBay, Heroku. And on the Clojure.org website, you can see a long list of companies. But still, Clojure is not like a popular language, you know. So you see there at the top is JavaScript, a little bit lower down is Python, then Java. C++, and Clojure is on the other side there. It's, can you see it? It's like towards the bottom, right after Haskell, Elixir, Julia, yeah. So it's 1.5%. Now it's probably a little bit more popular than this data suggests because we post our questions. This is from Stack Overflow. Uh, so we post our questions on other places. So, but still it's on the level of Haskell, Scala, as far as popularity goes. But as of 2002, it was the most highly paid programming language. And a lot of the reason for that is that it attracts more senior programmers who are tired of other languages, uh, but also because it's a very productive language and you can accomplish a lot. So it's not object oriented. Uh, so this is a quote from Rich Hickey, mutable stateful objects are the new spaghetti code Spaghetti, you know spaghetti? I don't know if you know this expression, spaghetti code. Spaghetti, you know, it's the spaghetti, the food, right? And it's all tangled up like this. And so spaghetti code is meant to talk about this thing that's all tangled up and so therefore hard to understand. And so with object-oriented programming, we have a lot of objects. So your program is basically lots and lots of objects that, can, that all interact with each other, right? They manipulate state. With you know you, you change this and this object this and this goes back to this and it's this mud of spaghetti that you don't really understand what's going on completely and it's hard to test and it's hard to think about and it's a disaster if you have concurrency in your program concurrency is multiple threads of execution yeah so you normally you have like one thread and then but if you want to have 
things happening at the same time, you introduce a new thread, and then if you pass something to that thread, it's best if it doesn't change, because if it changes, that's hard to coordinate and think about, and then you have to use something called locks to lock it, and it becomes very, very difficult. It's beyond human abilities, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, and so we have this idea in closure that we have just a few data structures, four primary ones, and we have a big set of functions that manipulate these data structures. And all of our programming happens in this manner. Instead of using objects, we use data structures. And we'll see in a second. Th these, this is the very basic stuff. These are the atomic data types that Clojure has. It's what you would expect from a programming language. S different ways to represent numbers, strings and characters, we have a couple of data type symbols, keywords that don't exist in every language. Booleans, true, false, nil, regular expressions. Basic stuff that you need for programming. But this is the main thing that where closure is different. This, this is what we program with. So these are literal representations of the four primary data structures that we use. So first we have the linked list, single linked list, grows at the front. So one, two, three, Fred, Ethel, Lucy. And the last example, the list one, two, three, that's a function. The list is a function, and you pass it the arguments one, two, three, and it returns a list with the values one, two, three. Next, we have the vectors. Vectors offer indexed access. They're kind of like your arrays or array lists. And probably in Python, they're called lists. Yeah. So the naming, there's some confusion with naming. But so I'm going to explain the idea. Uh, this is the index data structure that you index with an integer, you know, at index 0, at index 100, index 1000, and it offers you immediate access, uh, you know, constant time access to a particular index. And it grows automatically, you don't have to worry about it. Maps, in Clojure we call them maps, in Python they're called dictionaries, they're hash tables in other languages. The basic idea there, it's an associative data structure. You have a key, and under that key you have a value. You have a key, <coughs> value, key, value, and you can access a given key in constant time. That's the property of that data structure. And so these are a couple of literal representations. You can write this in your code, and that's a map, right? As opposed to, uh, so they're, they're first class, right? They're, they're, you can literally, just like you can write integer five in your code, and that's an integer, you have the literal map write in your code that you can put it. You can also have a function that produces a map. And then we have sets. That's the literal representation of a set. And sets, they're mathematical sets. They're just like the sets from math. And uh, they're very useful uh, when you need them. They support all the typical set operations like union, intersection, difference. And a key thing to note here that everything nests and everything is heterogeneous. Meaning what? Meaning in other languages that are statically typed, closure is dynamically typed. Uh, you have to define ahead of time, for example, that this is going to be a vector or an array of integers, and everything there has to be an integer. In closure, it can be an integer, then a string, then a character, anything. You can put anything and mix it any way you like. And all of the stuff, it nests arbitrarily. So you can have a map within a map, that has a vector under some key as a value, any level that you like, any number of levels in depth that you like. So this is very, very convenient. It does create some difficulties sometimes, and we'll talk about how we address that. Uh, this is just a bit more code, just to see what it looks like. Here we start with a hash map on top, so that's function hash map. We pass it key first name, value geo, and then another key value, and it returns a hash map. And then associ is a function, it stands for associate, so we add a new key value pair to that map, salary 10. And then we get back new map, and this is key, we get back a new map, and that old map still exists, we'll talk about that in a second. Key value, so now I have a salary of 10, and then I call update on that map, Update is a function that takes a map and updates it with a function. So we're going to update the salary key 
and we're going to use that function, that fn, that's an anonymous function. This function has no name, it's anonymous, and we're going to multiply the salary by 10, and that's how easy it is to multiply your salary. Uh, and then we have dissoge, and we're going to remove a key. Again, this is just to, just for you to see, get a feeling for what it looks like. And we also have something called the sequence abstraction. So all these data, uh, these uh, data structures that I just talked about, we can all treat them with the same abstraction over them. We can all treat them as a sequence. A sequence, to, to implement the sequence interface, basically to treat something as a sequence, it means you, all you have to do is to be able to say, give me the first element of a sequence, and then give me the rest of the sequence. So with lists, it's simple. You know, there's the head, and then there's the rest of the list. But it's the same for vectors and maps and sets. And then for these sequences, when we treat these data se structures as sequences, we have all our typical functions from programming, uh, from functional programming, like map, filter, reduce, and many, many more. And we can use the same functions. This is this is sort of the key idea: is that we can use the same set of functions on all of our data structures. So that you learn one set of functions and it works the same basically for all the data structures. That's how you really get code reuse as opposed to, we'll talk about later in object oriented programming, you don't really get that. This is just for you to get the idea that there are a lot of different functions uh, that manipulate the data structures. So these are the specific ones for lists, vectors, sets, maps, you don't have to learn all of them to start with closure. You just need a few to start, and then as you advance, you can learn the more useful ones. Yeah. And then this is the sequence library that takes care of the sequence extraction. Uh, I think I'll go from here to show you actually, to talk about the data science aspect of it. Uh, so in closure, we use hash maps to program everything. And Clojure is very much data oriented. So it's actually very helpful for uh, in, in data science. It's very useful. It, it's a good fit. And we have a lot of tools. This wasn't the original uh, idea behind this presentation. But it's a good tool uh, to use in data science. And I'll point you guys to some resources if you want to take a look. There's some videos on the internet about Clojure in data science specifically. Uh, I'll skip these sections on immutability. Now I'll talk about it, why not? Uh, so immutability is this idea that, let's say you have a hash table with uh, a million records, and then you add a new thing to it. So now you have a hash table with million one records. Usually, in programming languages, this is going to be what's called a mutable operation, meaning this Origi the, f the original hash table with a million records, it's now destroyed because now it's changed into a new one with a million and one records. What happens in closure is that the original map stays and there's a new map with a million and one records. And the key thing here is that this happens fast. You don't copy the whole thing. You don't copy a million record, records and then add one more. There's a way to do it, and this is sort of the secret source of closure. There's a way to do it that adding a new record while keeping the old data structure and creating a new one happens fast. I'm not going to go into details with that, but I just want to introduce this as an important idea. And this is an example which I'll skip. Uh, and a couple of other important things about Clojure as a language, as the ecosystem, is that it's very stable. Then that's good for a programmer because you don't have to keep learning new things all the time. In languages like, for example, JavaScript is notorious. Everybody complains. It's like everything changes all the time. You can't like, you know, you, you get sick for a week, you come back, everything is different. Uh, and this just shows the Clojure code base and how stable it is over time. And we can compare it to the Scala code base as an example. And this is Clojure and Scala side by side. So you can see on the left is Clojure with the code staying stable throughout the years. And you can see, I 
the Scala code is constantly changing. So there's a lot more about Clojure that I didn't talk about. A great community, a great REPL experience, mature tooling, metadata, much, much more. You can go to Clojure.org. And I'll talk about a couple of things that are sort of objections or, you know, things that are brought up as, well, what about this? Well, so Clojure is, not, is dynamically typed, no static types. Are you guys familiar with types, static types at all? Yeah, so when you write your program, like let's say in Java, you say, well, this function, it returns a string, and it takes two arguments, an integer and a string. So you have to say ahead of time what the types of things are. In Clojure, you don't have to say ahead of time what the things are, which is both good and bad. It's good because it allows you to develop things more quickly without defining, and it allows you to change things more quickly. And when you're first writing a program, you're experimenting a lot. So having to change things all the time is kind of, it's slowing you down. But the reason for these things called types is that we can then check to make sure that, okay, you said this is going to be a string, now I know it's a string, and the computer can check. Is it a string, actually? And if it's not a string, it can alert you, it can give you an error before you even run your program. That's the benefit, and I already explained the cost, and in closure we do it the other way. It's a choice that we make, you know, to make things, uh, make it more flexible and make it the development experience faster. And as far as, as, far, as far as finding closure programmers, it's, we don't have as many programmers that use closure, but we also uh, don't need as many, and we have our specific places where closure people hang out where you should post your jobs if you're interested. And you can always train people from other languages to use Clojure. If they're interested in programming in general, they will have no problem. All right, so I know that uh, this was a little bit much. Uh, it was not sort of uh, at the level that you guys are at currently. So maybe we can talk about whatever interests you, I don't know. I can show you actually what it looks like. This is closure. I'm gonna start a REPL. Oh man, it's too small. Do you have any questions, guys? Yeah. I think closure the you constantly have to check the types whatever you're working with. You as a programmer writing closure code? You don't have to constantly check the types. What do you mean by check the types? Like, uh, for example, we are working with the code, and like you said earlier, uh, it, because we don't have to specify it, yeah, uh, it might get confusing. Like yeah. So let's let's try to write something out. Let me create a new file here. Is this big enough? More. Okay, that's as big as it gets. So let's say this is a function. This is how you write a function. Let's just call it, what is your name? Ma. Spell? M-A-N-E. -E. Yeah. Okay, there we go. And you take one argument, uh, I don't know, skill. <laughs> so, and let's say when you Call Mane, your skill increases. So inc is a function that will increment by one, an integer. So your question is, do you have to check the type? So skill is the argument to your function. Do you have to check the type? You can. You can. You have that option. But you don't have to. So in this case, because we're calling inc on it, this has to be an integer because the function inc operates on integers. It's not in the code, it's in your head. I mean, you just kind of know it, right? So, and I'll show you the REPL too. Uh, so here we can, this is how we typically work in closure. Unfortunately, I can't increase the font of the REPL, so. But I'm gonna s use a shortcut to send this to, oh, namespace not found, let me load the namespace. 
So now we have the function Manet available here, and we can call just to see how it works. Manet one. No, oh, I have to define the function. Yeah, now we have it. Unable to use I have to change the namespace. Okay, now we have it. Okay, do you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, but if I call Manet and I give the string one, that's a string, we'll, we'll have a type error. So yes, you're gonna have this type of problem at runtime, and in a statically typed language, you're gonna have this problem at compile time. You, so before you run your program, it'll tell you, well, th that's not gonna work. So you could do something like this, if int, so you can check, skill, if, if it's an integer, then we'll do the thing. But if not, we'll print an error. Error. Scale not an integer. Right. So, and this is how we work in Clojure, by the way, is we can write these functions, and I'm going to send this to the REPL. So now it's redefined. So now when I call this function, on, on the integer one, it will still return two, and if I call it on the string one, see, it gives you that error message. So you can check, and sometimes you want to, but it's up to you to decide when it's important and when it's not important. Uh, any other questions? I can do a few, yeah, yeah. Can you make model for <clears throat> oh yeah, yeah. You you kind of missed the presentation. So oh, let me let me show you. Let me show you. So that that two slides related to what you're asking. So is closure popular? No, it's over there, one point five percent. Wow. Uh huh. But it's the most highly paid programming language as of last year. So yes, you can make money with closure. Very. I made make money with closure all the time. Uh, <laughs> Even now, no, now, no, now this is, this, I'm losing money right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's a smaller, it's a niche language and you have to be open to working remotely and that means English, but yeah, absolutely. If you get to a certain level, you can make money with Clojure G. In fact, I think it's a better career for a programmer because like I mentioned earlier, it's much more stable you don't have to keep learning new things. It just works. Mm -hmm. New versions of Clojure don't break your existing code ever. Mm -hmm. And the libraries are much more stable. The ecosystem is much more stable. Yeah. yeah. Aren't the less popular programming languages more, uh, uh, it's easier uh, for creating those languages to make money? Like, uh, no, I don't think so. I think it depends on the specific language. Uh, less popular programming languages, that's a very big category. And some, most languages are less popular because they deserve to be. <laughs> but some languages that are less popular, for example, one of the issues with Clojure, you see all these parentheses. This is weird. You get used to it fast, but when people see it, they reject it just like, oh, what is this? Is it? Uh, so that's one reason. Another reason is that uh, Basically, the closure empowers the programmer, and corporations prefer languages where programmers can be more interchangeable. Yeah. Didn't you earlier study Java? Yeah. Yeah. It's better uh, at first study other language and then change to uh, this one, or start with this. Uh, That's a good question. I think you probably want to study at least two languages that are different from each other. To, yeah, which one you start with? If I want to study Clojure to make money, yeah. before that, uh, I'd like to uh, study, for example, Python or Java, or I can start with uh, Clojure? You can definitely start with Clojure, but as you're learning Clojure, you're going to have to learn a little bit about Java. You don't have to learn Java, 
but you have to learn something, just some basic things about Java, the basic ideas of how it works. Because Clojure is written, it ho it's hosted on the Java virtual machine. And in fact, let me show you, we do things, oh, we use Java from Clojure. So for example, we can do something like index of uh, A, B, C, B. Will that work? No matching index of, so it takes. But basically, I'm trying to show, uh, this has to be a character. I'm trying to show that this is actually not a closure function. This is a job, this index of, because it starts with the dot, that's what tells you. Int. Ah, yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, it's not important what it's doing. The point is that this is a Java function. So you're going to have to learn something about Java. Because if it already exists in Java, we usually don't implement it in Clojure because we just use what's in Java. Because Java is fast, it's tested, it's there, it's good. You know. And you mentioned about uh, when we have a list which constitute millions of, uh, for example, yeah. items. Yeah. And when we add one, uh, it becomes a new list. And yeah. uh, do we take a space more? Or if we okay. add the uh, last one? Yeah, you're asking good questions. This is a very complicated idea of how this works. Uh, it does take a little bit more space to answer your question. Well, let me give you a very simple explanation with the list. I was talking about a hash table, which is more complicated. But with the list, let's use red. So let's say you have the list. This is a linked list. This is the head pointer. And it has like, a linked list looks like this, right? One, two, Three, this is H for head. So this is your head pointer to your list, and you one, two, three. And then you want to add something to the list without destroying this list, right? Let's and we with linked lists we often uh, add to the front. Actually, it's okay. I wanna. Okay, thank you. We want to create a new list, h prime, and we want to add 0. So see, this is the new list. Yeah, mm -hmm. you see it? But the old list is still there. Because this is still there, because they share structure. Mm -hmm. This is called structural. Oh, and this is of course, of course, there's a link here. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, so in this case, it does not take up more space. But in the case of math, so I just wanted to d demonstrate this idea of structural sharing because it's very simple for linked lists. It's much less simple for, for example, hash table. With hash tables, you can do the same idea, mm -hmm. but you need trees that look like this. There are high branching factor trees, and there's like another tree here, and each one of these cells looks like that. And this idea, when it becomes more complex, can be implemented. So the new, uh, the new map takes more space, a little bit more space. But it's not double the space. It's much, much less than double. Uh, okay. I thought it would be the double and take a bunch of uh, 
space, for example, it is a and a work server. Uh, no, no, no. It is a little bit. That's actually the big problem that Clojure had to solve. Can I raise this? Okay. Uh, what if we change one of the elements? Then it's a problem. Then it's more, more difficult. Then you have to do something more complex. This was just to illustrate the idea, just so you have conceptually understand what's, what structural sharing is. And there's a more complex way. So, I mean, just to take it one step further. Uh, let's say this is a hash table with a bunch of trees and let's say and there's a hashing algorithm that puts like you, you, you know let's say it's a key value pair you know a, a, a one and it goes here and then you want to create something else you want to add for example to this map uh, and you have like this is there's 32 of these cells here yeah and 32 here, and it can go many levels. Usually it's only three or four levels. And when you add a new thing, you decide, okay, where does it have to go? Which one of these, you know, like there's one, da, 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 32. Let's say you, know, you decide with your algorithm that it has to go here. Mm -hmm. So now all of this stays the same, but this has to change. So we add the new thing, let's say, here. And then we have to change this also. Because this is the old map. And we create a new one. And it's identical in every way to this. Yes, yeah, so all of these, they go to the same places. Except this last one. This last one no longer goes here. It goes here. So that's how we share structure. It's complicated, but it's an interesting idea. So it is a little bit slower than if you just have something and you change it in place all the time, then, 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 then. But you have this tremendous benefit of it becoming immutable, meaning you still have the old thing and uh, you can pass it like, so this, this is the new map, but this one is still here. Mm -hmm. And you can pass it and it, it's not gonna change. So if I pass it to another thread, that thread doesn't have to worry that this is gonna change because there's, it's going, just going to be a new thing. With traditional mutable data structures, if I want to pass this, yeah, I pass this off, and then I do this operation, well, this is going to change. And that creates a lot of difficulty in programming. I'll leave it there. That's why you it. Well, that's one of the reasons, yes. It's, it's Well, yeah, that's why I said, watch this guy's talks. This is Rich Hickey. His name is Rich Hickey. He's the author of Closure. And he was a programmer. He is a programmer. He's, just, he's not an academic. He's not a professor. He's an industry programmer working on real things. And he talks a lot about his frustrations with like Java, C++, and why he created Closure and what he was thinking about. Uh, any other questions? I don't know. We have 10 minutes, I think. We can go longer. As whatever you want. I'm here if you want. If you want to end here, any questions, anything? About clear method, about programming, uh, until September, I want to study, for example, a basic of some uh, programming languages. Uh -huh. And what should I do or should I do it? Yeah, you, you, you should definitely do it, because what else are you going to do? <laughs> uh, what you should study? So, I talked about closure. Closure is not usually taught at universities, very rare. Uh, so if this is interesting to you, you could study this, but you have to know that in university you will be studying something different. So if you just want to make your life in university easier, start whatever they're gonna, you know, start studying whatever is on the curriculum for your university. Mm -hmm. If you wanna broaden your perspective and learn about other ways of programming, study closure, for example, or something else that's not on your university curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, but that's more work for you, but 
it'll make you better, I promise. I want to study something to make money easier. Yeah, I understand. You can just go, you know, it's, you can just go with the typical Python, JavaScript, and you'll make money. I mean, I don't know, how much money do you need? Do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, to earn enough to live in the air, for example, uh, like You can do that with any language. Yeah? Yeah. Anything else? No? Okay. We'll end it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.